Are you taping this? In terms of the major barriers in the evolution yeah. of receivers, the first one was the detector and uh, the two yeah. circuits and the Q problem and selectivity. Right. Then, then came the super hint, and by that time the tetrodes had come out. Tetrodes and then higher gain tetrodes. And, and then you had the problem of, of oscillator stability. The first tubes were called screen grid tubes. They introduced another element into the into the uh, tube to make a tetrode out of it. They did not have the third and fourth elements in them. The gain then was restricted because, in fact, as, as they went on, they introduced other elements. So that, that while this was going on, the, the, the demand for the tube was so great that uh, immediately they tried to figure out tubes with, with much higher gain. And then, see, with the superhead coming in, uh, this now, two elements uh, were necessary. Stability in the oscillator. And then the mixer, because you then you because we had to introduce a frequency into an element that would then change it over or convert it into another frequency, and so that mixers with high mutual conductance were the, were the next step as it, as it went along in order to get a high conversion ratio. The first audio oscillators were beat frequency oscillators. So one oscillator beat against another oscillator to make the audio frequencies. And you can imagine you had the stability of two oscillators to worry about. Crystal control didn't come in until quite a bit later. But anyway, the, ne the next evolution in the, in the super hat was, was the mixer to get high mutual conductance so that you come out with it with a uh, 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 a big signal. Then, when all this was happening, then you had the problem of strong signal uh, response and creating parasitic signals that would, would occur without the band or locking up. So that the development of the mixer was very, very important. And it wasn't until much, much, much many years later that they came up with balanced mixers that eliminated all this problem and then with, with semiconductor mixers. Which, which had their own problems in the sense that it takes a lot more oscillator drive to work a semiconductor mixer than it, it did with the, with the, uh, with the old uh, uh, vacuum tube mixers. So each one of these things was a step as it went along. One thing developed the need for something else. IF transformers were another thing. And C, it was necessary to produce high Q tuned circuits in the IF things, which brought up, went way back to the fact that at these frequencies, a multi strand insulated wire, Litson draught, as I remember. And the, then the second thing on it, which I should have mentioned before, is that during the course of, of developing, trying to get better Qs on the tuned circuits, they so-called honeycomb coil was developed. Now bear in mind that when you take a solenoid, when you uh, wind adjacent turns, the distributed capacity of this solenoid tends to nullify the selectivity of it. So the point was when they developed the uh, honeycomb coil, the, the point was that the windings went over like this so that one turn was not adjacent to the other. And it went there so that the distributed capacity was much less than with a, a regular solenoid and so the cues were better. And, and so that for a while there were receivers developed with vacuum tubes, but they used two honeycomb coils. Now John Reinhardt's, uh, who was a, a, did a lot of work and worked for uh, IMAC and other people, uh, developed a, a Reinhardt's tuner, which was a pair of, of honeycombs that uh, you were able to couple again or decouple by uh, in a in mechanical arrangement to move them in and out. And so I should uh, have told you that there was an intermediate step in, in trying to achieve, and there were probably other steps, trying to achieve 
selectivity in the tuned RF, which is what we're talking about with the uh, tetrode, for lack of a better, better term. The Reinhardt's tuner, in amateur circles, and he borrowed that from, as you just pointed out, that it was used in broadcast, broadcast receivers. See, in broadcast band, the same thing happened. If you didn't get some selectivity, you, you get all your broadcast stations, one would overlap the other. So selectivity was, the gain was important, but selectivity was just as important. Back to the quest for higher Qs and IF transformers. Well, see, again now, they, they found out that they could achieve a higher Q by putting multiple strands of insulated wire, winding them together, and using this literally as a one-piece piece of wire. That at these frequencies, which we're talking now about, anything from 50 kilohertz uh, to 450, which was, first of all, was a standard frequency. And they found out that the Q, by using this type of wire to wind it, to put the winding together, that the uh, Q was, was higher. And in addition, however, these coils were all wound on the honeycomb, or as they call it, dual-lateral way, which, which tended to decrease the distributed capacity and further enhance the Q. There was another factor that, that enters into this, and that is the transformers in, instead of being a single inductor, a uh, tuned inductor capacitive coupled on either side, they then now set up another factor which was called inductive coupling. So these IF transformers were composed of two windings, a primary and a secondary, each winding tuned to the resonant frequency of the of the 456 or 465, and then by uh, taking optimum coupling, so you can overcouple, you can undercouple by moving the two, two coils together, so that there's an optimum place in there, so that the shape of the band that this covers is symmetrical. As you overcouple, you come down and you dip in the middle and you come back up. This way, if your coupling is properly shaped, then you can come up with a reasonably wave shape of proper width to permit you to pass that much whatever frequency you want to pass. Like for instance, in AM, the, the coupling had to be arranged so that the thing were not flat top, but they, they were broad on the top so that you could have a bandwidth of maybe 6 kilohertz. Whereas when we started to get into to CW, we wanted to get down as narrow as possible. Sideband came along much, much, much later. What do you think was the greatest engineering problem to overcome in the in the design? Well, oh, I system? think they were all they, they they were selectivity was one, stability was another, the inductor which essentially controls the the frequency and the capacitor. This is the atmospheric effects. So the thing, the temperature, the room gets warm, the room gets cold, and or it gets whatever. As it does this, the inductance minutely changes, and since the inductors, inductance is controlling essentially the frequency, the frequency tends to drift. So that the hotter it gets, the, the more it drifts. So you set it up, and, and ten minutes later, you have to reset it. So Collins came up with a pretty good idea. Collins said, all right, we'll take this thing, we'll, we'll, we won't try to make different inductors. We'll, we'll use a solenoid inductor, but we'll put them in a controlled environment. So they put them in a sealed environment with a dissicator in there. The dissicator screwed Desicator. into the top of the unit. So the unit was, as you say, perhaps nitrogen sealed. I'm not too sure. But in any case, uh, he did overcome the, the effective environmental changes on the oscillator. And then he eliminated another factor of the fact that in a variable capacitor, bear in mind now <coughs> that as the temperature changes, the spacing of the plates changes with it. And as the spacing of the plate changes, so does the frequency change. So Collins eliminated the variable capacitor entirely and used what's known as a permeability 
tuning device. In other words, when you take a, a, a specialized type of ferrite type of core and put it into an inductor, it will increase the inductance or decrease it as it pulls in and out. Incidentally, it lowers the Q to some degree, but since you're not uh, worried too much about Q, it would only lower it as the thing went into it and then the Q would arise as it came out. Incidentally, on the, on the IF transformers, they were tuned the same way, probably for the same reason, to eliminate essentially a variable capacitor. Although uh, some of the early ones did have compressed mica capacitors that you tuned with. Later on, they came out with zero coefficient mica capacitors, which were fixed across it. Anyway, back to Collins. He, number one, he got rid of the environment by sealing the, the oscillator, uh, and he got rid of the variable capacitor by using a so-called solenoid type of thing, which worked on a lead screw. As you turned this thing, it went in and changed the frequency as it went higher or lower. So this, this was one of the first steps. Then, see, we're ignoring the fact that crystal control was coming in here at about this time. A lot of people were, were working on, were developing the, the grinding of crystals from the quartz. In other words, when you take a quartz crystal and, and go through a certain axis, you come up with an effect. When you cut this soil apart, you come up with a, a piece of quartz that will exhibit called a piezoelectric effect. So that means that when you when you start this, you start this thing oscillating by a pulse. The the crystal then will oscillate at, at a frequency depending upon its thickness. And then when it does this, as it as it moves up and down, it develops a voltage, and this voltage can then be uh, used out to control the frequency of an oscillator at the frequency of of this particular crystal. All these are coming along simultaneously, so that uh, present-day receivers, you know, we, we have to jump ahead uh, 25 and 30 years to come up to uh, uh, crystal control uh, in receivers.